Imagine two things you enjoy, great individually, but put them together and you get something quite special. Strawberries and cream, egg and bacon, yawning and scratching, Johnson and Johnson, Charles and Camilla. But what about drugs and sex? This is chemsex. Chemsex is a compound word. Chem derived from the word chemical and sex from the word sex or sexiness. Confined largely to the gay community, it emerged around the year 2010. A time of unrestrained glee as a nation dared to believe the nightmare of a Labour government could soon be over. And as revellers lost their minds to the sound of Keen and the Black Eyed Beans, little wonder that the hedonism spilled over into sex and drugs. The primary drugs involved in chemsex are crystal meth, GHB, ketamine and mephedrone, a dose of which, under controlled conditions, I was about to take myself under the watchful eye of pharmacist Dr. Raj Prasan. Now, do you say MCAT or Meow Meow? I say mephedrone, it's a chemical name. Right, I like to say Meow Meow. You're going to administer this drug under controlled circumstances, uh, and then I'm going to gauge its effects. You're going to play guinea pig. Right, That's, uh, that wasn't explained to me. Uh, I've never played that. I mean, in terms of the experiment. Oh, right. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I thought it was some sort of gay sex game. Yeah. Mind you, I'm not sure a man can squeal like a guinea pig, can he? I'm just a pharmacist. Right, yeah, because you're, you're, the, you're the chem of the chem sex, yeah. Uh, so Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you're the, you're the Dr. Chem and uh, Mr. Sex we've yet to meet. I'm just a pharmacist. You said that, you said that. So, you give us the drugs. Well, it's 30 minutes later, and I don't feel especially different. Uh, certainly, the thought of grinding myself against a stranger in a Holiday Inn is far from my thoughts. Yeah. Well, it's over an hour later. I've been told that one eyelid has drooped. I don't feel that much different. Uh, am I in the mood for dancing? Absolutely. Uh, do I feel sexy? Barely. Uh, although I do have the uh, sensation of wanting someone else to brush my hair. It's said the experiment replicates exactly the sensation of recreational drug use. Although instead of being surrounded by revellers, chewing gum and asking if you're having a good time, my only companion was a bearded doctor drinking coffee and reading a magazine. Well, the effects have completely worn off. My main recollection is an overwhelming desire to put on my comfy pyjamas and watch Tarzan. Is that sexy? I've no idea. But it was a very new feeling, and it was a very real feeling. So, drama therapy. It's therapy that uses role play to help people work through difficult or challenging situations. Well, like therapy, good drama encourages us to look inside. Mm. It helps us to understand our own behaviour and deal with emotional issues. In fact, Simon was telling me earlier that Aristotle coined the term catharsis to describe the healing we experience through drama. Hubris, nemesis, catharsis. Well, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> Thought I'd do the joke this time, seeing as uh, Simon was being a bit serious. But what kind of problems does drama therapy help to confront? It's very versatile. Marital strife, uh, workplace disagreements, psychological trauma. Drama therapy is not always easy. It can be very challenging and sometimes tearful, mm. but it should always feel welcoming. I think you just described the pub quiz I go to. <laughs> you see, you should be saying this. Uh, now, I believe that we're going to see some drama therapy in action. That's right, Jenny. Um, over here, we have two actors, mm -hmm. Daniel and Louise. And in a typical therapy situation, they would play out scenarios that couples can try themselves. Right. Um, now, in this scenario, Louise thinks that Daniel is emotionally closed off, but Daniel feels that as he's getting older, he does need more space. Guys? And you wonder why we never resolve anything. It's because we argue, and then five minutes later, you get upset and I have to back down. No one's saying you have to. But that's what happens when you play that card. It's not a card, Daniel. It's how I feel. Just because you're a closed book doesn't mean I have to be. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? You should tell her that... Sorry, that's... No, 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 that's fine. Do you want to jump in? 
Oh, me? God, no. Yeah, no, please do. Step in for Daniel. No, I, it's just it, it, I've not acted for quite a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I hadn't realised you'd acted. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, just with North Norfolk players, a bit of acting, producing, directing. Most recently, uh, A Few Good Men. Oh, so, amazing. What part did yeah. you play? The Jack Nicholson role, so, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, a bit, a, bit, a bit of a tough act to follow, but uh, I just tried to do it so, you know, like... like the truth! You can't handle the truth! Yeah, so I, so I sort of went higher and then I did the scoff at the end, which I don't think Nicholson thought of, so... Well, how would you feel about having a go at this scene? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, great. OK, um, Daniel, you step out. Louise, you're in the kitchen, you're making dinner. And Alan, just start a conversation uh, when you're ready. OK. Um, um. Don't overthink it. OK, yep, right. Mmm. Smells good. It's just spag bowl. I didn't mean the dinner. Well, you never normally come in till it's cold. I'm sorry to go on. I just don't want you to feel like I'm complaining because I want to spend time with you. Hey, baby girl. Just been out of my bike. My motorcycle's important to me. You know that. But you know the best part of the journey? <laughs> Riding that steel horse back home to you. Try it without the accent. Me or her? You. OK, but the general direction... Don't forget all that. Both of you sit at the table. OK. Now, let's just pretend that she's your actual wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I wish I could spend more time with you. See, I hear you saying that, but I don't feel it. Then we'll figure something out, but you're going to have to stop going on at me. I'm sorry if I've got a gift that people enjoy and I find very satisfying. I'm sorry that you don't have that because for some reason God didn't give you any talent. Shall we stop there? Yeah, that felt good. Quiz. One of these people spent World War II sewing uniforms, the other flying spitfires. So, which was which? The answer will surprise you. The seamstress, this man who got into sewing rather than fighting because he was severely mollycoddled by his mother and, sadly, the poor chap ended up as a softie. The spitfire pilot, a woman, Eleanor Hartley, who defied convention to help transport military aircraft to wherever it was needed. Because it's an irrefutable fact that without the role played by women in almost every sphere in both civil and military life, the Second World War would have been slightly harder to win. Today, Eleanor is 94 and has very kindly agreed to join us here at Goodwood Aerodrome to return to the wonderful machines that she once flew. Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us. It's lovely to be here. A wonderful, wonderful woman to whom we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude. In the end, though, her interview was largely unusable. Heavy frost this morning. Mm -hmm. To learn more, I spoke to a man much better versed in Spitfire history. Good morning. My name's Alan. Roger. And your name? Roger. Oh, sorry, I thought you were agreeing with me. No, just telling you my name. Oh, I see. Right. Well, I'm Alan Partridge. Roger that. Right. And uh, your full name? That. Is your name... Don't say anything. Is your name Roger that? It turns out the airman, a bit of a character with a love of wordplay, is actually called Paul Wheeler. But he pretends to be called Roger that to bamboozle new trainees. So he has also just, appeared uh, on Countdown. I really didn't do jokes like that because I'm a journalist. Now, Eleanor here, one of the few people left alive who understands what it was like to fly the Spitfire and, and carry that huge responsibility. What was it like, do you think, for people like Eleanor to carry such huge responsibility? Well, I don't, I don't think anyone was in any doubt as to how integral Spitfire was to the war effort. I suppose the only way to truly understand the sacrifice made by Eleanor and people like her is for me to put myself in their shoes. So if the plane gets into trouble, there's no ejector seat, so you'll have to bail out. Why would the plane get into trouble? Oh, we just have to give you the bailout procedure. OK. So if the pilot says, jump, 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 you lower the seat, you unlatch the canopy, you unplug the radio, open the door, jump away from the plane and deploy your parachute by pulling the D-ring. D-ream? No, D-ring. Yes, of course. Now, if you land in water... Oh, hang, hang on, hang on. Say it again? Yes, again. Lower the seat, unlatch seat. the canopy, canopy, unplug the radio... Why not do door. that bit? Well, you need to do that bit, otherwise you'll be tethered to the plane and pulled down to earth with it. OK, I'll definitely do that then. I'll just uh, asterisk the important ones. Well, they were all important. Yeah, I'll asterisk all of them then. 
And after a handful of toilet trips, which I'm told is perfectly normal, it was time to spread my wings like the arms of a bird and take off. Does this say latch or cat? Can't look right now, sorry. Can you radio and ask someone? Not right now. OK, but soon. I was quickly lost in admiration for this plucky little aeroplane, and it was a privilege to climb heavenwards until I was touching the face of God with the very tip of my nose. Up here, you can be proud to be British, and uh, no left wing people can tut at you. No one to admonish you by having a certain point of view. No one accusing you of culturally appropriating a Moroccan to be wearing a fez, even though you've only got us, Tommy Cooper. Sometimes wonder why we bothered winning the war. If you're scratching your head wondering why Simon Denton is sitting on the sofa, do not adjust your set. It does look odd. Simon is here to introduce his very first item, perhaps the shape of things to come. Uh, well, just a one-off. He's, he's on holiday on the sofa, but he lives at the Digi-Wall. Simon. Now, when one pensioner's local cinema closed, his plans for a birthday movie were scuppered. That was until his friends decided to step up and reenact his favourite Hitchcock film, Rear Window. I went along to take a look. And action! And we're off. Oh, that was so good. That was great. It was good, 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 good for you, mate. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good. It's grainy black and white. That's, uh, is that to look a bit... Uh, Hitchcock. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely, yeah. I mean, rear window's in colour, of course, but I don't think that matters uh, one bit. So how did this land in your lap? Um, I just mentioned it to Howard and he said, yeah, give it a go. Yeah. You know, you can always talk to me about work stuff like we agreed, mate. Yeah. Quick shot of you nodding. It's just an edit point. Edit point? I've been here a while. I'm starting to learn how things work. Are you? Here comes a good bit. Excuse me. Tiff, you're not going to... We've got to take a rain check on Cornwall. Aww. I know, I know. I just... i got a couple of Japanese business associates flying in from Japan to possibly invest in the Bloomin' Production Company, so... What business associates? Uh, John Kawasaki and John Suzuki. Yeah. John Yamaha couldn't make it. Um, I suppose they are both named after Japanese motorcycle brands. No, I tried to move it, but um, I said, John, Johns, um, could you make it any other weekend? But they said, no can do. No can do. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know, it's Japanese, uh, the way they do talk in a slightly funny way. You should really laugh. <laughs> yeah, uh, Japanese. Uh, Don't dick me about. Places, people, and we're back in five, four. Ah, oh, Simon Denton reporting there. Didn't you do a good job? Uh... And they were so welcoming, not just Annie Arnold at number 10, but all her neighbours on Davenport Close in Kirkstall. A real community. Oh, right. lovely. Are you, not, are you allowed to give out someone's name and address like that on camera? I'm not sure. Don't know. Right, I shouldn't have assumed you knew. It's just that when you've been here uh, a while, you learn how things work. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're all right. Our apologies there, just for a slight slip-up. It's live TV, we all have our moments. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have all this problem, but he just sticks to the jokes. I had the VT to Can't you do both? No time, mate. We want a giggle. <laughs> Give us a break. <laughs> I did, remember? I'm outside the University of West Sussex, and in their computer science department, they're developing some of the most advanced robotics anywhere outside of America and China and Germany and Japan. Also, Singapore. Love these guys. Electric lady. Nice. Destroyed. What's it capable of? That's just the coffee machine. Got it. Is this a coffee machine? No. Could be. Doesn't make coffee. 
So this is the unit here. It's a fully electronic torque controlled quadruped. We foresee a lot of uses in the industrial cleaning sector as well as around the home. Yeah, it's quite a noisy little, uh, I want to say chap, not quite sure what to call it. Her nickname is Lady. Yeah, I, I don't really do nicknames. Can you switch it off, please? I asked you to turn it off, please. Sorry, love. Oh. I've got to say, I remain something of a sceptic. Call me a Luddite, I don't even have a tease made. Let alone a computerised Japanese toilet like Jonathan Ross. I've thrown a heavy towel over Alexa. Nevertheless, the nerds here have allowed me to take this robot dog home. Its name is Unit 1, not Lady. First, I wanted to put it through its paces. And with four legs powered by four servo motors, it's a robot with as much bite as bark. Not the quietest droid, but with a top speed of a nifty six, it's quick enough to outrun anyone with a mobility issue. But are we ready for robots? Could you trust this face? Look at it. The idea of robotics isn't new. Aristotle wrote about automata replacing slavery in 322 BC. That's three centuries before Christ. Allow me to put that in context. That he just did. Well, and then there was Buddhist scholar Dao Xuan who imagined metal humanoid automata that could recite sacred texts. So the appearance of being intelligent was actually just the ability to read out loud. Precisely. Yeah. Hugh Edwards. But what if doing no harm involves moral ambiguity? Take self-driving cars. What if swerving to avoid hitting someone on the road involves mounting the curb and hitting someone else? How does the robot decide whom to harm and whom to save? Could use the word whom, but it is a dilemma. If a, a robot car was hurtling towards a pregnant woman pushing a pram, of course, it would swerve to avoid her, even if it meant hitting another pedestrian. But what if that pedestrian was a senior politician like Grant Shapps? Now you've put that robot in an impossible situation. Well, there's also the issue of automatons serving us in a range of different ways, um, some of them in perhaps more intimate ways. Do you mean sex robots? Well, yes. Yeah, that's weird, because I don't think I've thought about that before. But do you think that would be all right, then, to do that? Well, it's a question that's never been addressed. Because there could be for women, too. It's a case of adapting an existing unit. But perhaps a more complex issue is how to manage an emotional connection. You could imagine a robot one day providing the same companionship a dog might. My dog would be a hard act to follow. Yes, some people do form strong emotional attachments with their dogs. Not like me and Seldom. Is, uh, he passed on a couple of weeks ago. But I, I was actually at a fun fair. In one minute he was barking at the waltzers, the next minute he was, as I thought, asleep next to the ghost train, funnily enough. But um, no, he'd... Um, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. Ah, yeah, he's a big fella, yeah, but I tell you, he showed a damn sight more sensitivity than half the people on this planet. Well, that's the thing with these moral dilemmas. I think it's... He used to stand on his hind legs and put his paws on his shoulders and then just dance around the room. Yeah. Yeah. I miss him. He's a really, really good dog. And there we have it, a brief but fascinating exchange between Jenny Gresham and the Princess Royal. Plenty to unpack. Um, we learned Her Royal Highness is, in her words, very well and uh, pleased that she could be here. Uh, she went on to describe her duties as varied and talked about her affection for her family. Good, solid stuff. Now, though, it's time to hear from you at home as we ask for your thoughts on what the future holds for Britain's favourite family. Of course, we've also been asking for your encounters with royalty and uh, don't forget to share your tips on modern day etiquette. Keep those coming in. And tomorrow, should we scrap mm -hmm. HS2? Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, we do need to hear viewers. <laughs> Why? Why do we need to hear from the viewers? Tell us what you think, join the conversation, get involved, share your views. Is it snowing where you are? Do you like fireworks? What's your favourite soup? Who gives a shit? Uh, excuse me, apologies for the language Michael, there. Michael Gove said we've had enough of experts. Do you know who I've had enough of? Idiots. I'm not sure I'd call our audience idiots. Look at the tweets, Jenny. I mean, read the mailbag. Everyone at the BBC thinks it. They never say it publicly, of course, but behind closed doors. 
whispered in the corridors. That's where you hear the truth. They think country file is boring, they don't understand darts, and they don't really care about your opinion. Uh, the BBC is committed to letting ordinary people have their say. Th 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 there's nothing in between. It's either BBC Four Live from the Hay on Why Book Festival or other people telling us they think dogs are better than cats. You feel like throwing open your windows and saying, I am hopping mad and I want something in the middle. Are you finished? Julian Fellows. I don't like Julian Fellows. What's that got to do with your no, argument? Nothing. I just don't like him. Well, I'm sure, Simon, we have plenty of viewers getting in touch with their royal story. Uh, well, actually, we're getting people shouting Alan's slogan from their windows and tweeting in to let us know. Let's see, we've got Bournemouth, I'm hopping mad, I just want something in the middle. South End, I'm hopping mad, I want something in the middle. Uh, same with Warrington, I'm hopping mad, something in the middle. Hull... I've tossed a nerve. Any, anything from London? Nothing from London, no. Well, we're in London. Let's go and have a look. Terry, come with me. Simon, do you want to come? No. I'm sorry I clouted you. It's all right. Everyone, go to your windows, open your windows, and, and, and just shout out at the top of your voice, I'm, I'm, I'm hopping mad and I want something in the middle. That's right. Follow me, sorry. Uh, I can, hear, I can hear them now. Okay. Keep shouting. He's shouting. Hey, you. Say, say that again. Say the whole thing. Right, so you get that? Cheers. Cheers! Uh, good. They're all saying it. Hey, yeah, all right, whatever. Fucking idiot. Yeah, that, that's not going to happen. Any, anyone else hopping mad who just wants something in the middle? No, that's, we can't count you twice. Uh, anyone else? Any more? No? I mean, that's, that's three people. It's safe for every person who complains. There's another 20 who silently agree, so... That's 60 people in this area, at least. <clears throat> Minimum. You roll that out across the country. It's got to be a million. <sighs>